Welcome everybody to Drama Education Live, episode 52. And today we have the lovely and amazing Mike McKenzie. What's up? Thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks for um, asking. Pleasure, pleasure, treasure. Um, so we know each other mm -hmm. and I just want to know you're an amazing drummer and you do other things as well. You've got like uh, your own filming company going on. Um, but I want you to tell me about when you first started drumming and how that came into your life. Okay. Now there was a band at school and back then we used to call it like the fifth year, which is now the year 11. So last year of school. And there was a band that I used to follow around. So I was like the roadie for this band. So whenever there was a school assembly or any thing happening with the band, I was there just helping move stuff around. And my other friend called Dennis, he was the manager of the band. Yeah, so we, we had these roles. Sixth form came along. I left and went to study electronics, but I didn't have the right grades. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to go back to school for another year. I still have to meet a drummer who had the proper grades. It's a harsh ha world. I <laughs> haven't met <laughs> one yet. <laughs> I had to go back to school and study some more for a whole year. And during that process, as I said, the drummer had left. So I joined the band. And the keyboard player who he played everything. Right. And he was left-handed as well. No offense to anybody that's left-handed, but he was teaching me everything, how to do 16s on the hi-hat, all these weird beats. So he taught me how to play and I, I was in the band. So that's how I kind of got started. Yeah. And I can still remember my first gig in assembly where the school I went to was William Gladstone High School in Crickerwood which is no longer there, but the kids were interesting, like me. <laughs> and they tried to intimidate me on my first gig by, they were literally like this close. Wow. Oh play. no. <laughs> no, I was just shaking, man. <laughs> so I, was I, was, I was, I was, I'm obviously traumatized by that experience, but it was fun, but I can still remember it. And that, that was some time ago, I can tell you. So I've never forgotten that. And um, yeah, that was how I kind of started, you know? Oh. And, the, and the freaky thing is six months into the year, uh, now I, I'm gonna claim that I was a drummer at that time. Yeah, six months into the time, one of my teachers came to me and says, Mike, they made a mistake with your grades. Wow, said, no. Yeah, right. So the grades that I eventually got, I could have got into college. No. Yep. It was a freaky thing. And, you know, when people talk about mistakes and errors, for me, that is a mistake that I'm so happy that was made. <laughs> you know, because I've never stopped playing. That's yeah. nuts. Do you think, do you think you would have found a way to drum or? or... Well, I think I would, uh, I, I don't know, to be truthful, because I think I was, the only instrument I really played during school time was trumpet. Yeah, I played a little bit of trumpet. And then, but I was also DJing as well. So whenever there was a party, a family party, I'd be behind the decks, DJing. So I know that I had a musical bone in there somewhere. Um, so it was more, I don't know, it literally an opportunity arose and I took it with both hands. But were you interested in drumming before or was it just like... Not, not really, no, not really. I can't think that I was, that I, I seek to ask if, right, I'm going to play drums. It was more the drummer left and I thought, I'm going to play drums. And that was it. You know, I just, I just slotted in there. I had to be in that band, basically. And, you know, I, I believe in destiny and things happen for a reason. And, you know, there's lots of ifs and buts 
around that whole time, I could have gone in so many different directions. That's amazing. You know? Did you did you go on to have any lessons or I don't even know this about you. I mean, are you are you 100 percent self taught? What's what's the history there? OK, so I was self taught for quite a while. Um, and then I probably for about three years. Um, and then what happened was my brother, older brother started playing bass and my younger brother started playing guitar. So we got a little, we had a little band going on and I had a good friend of mine that used to live in, well, not in the alleyway, but we used to play in the alleyway. He played, he was learning bass. So he actually used to come to the school. I'm, I'm just remembering this as I'm talking. He actually, his school was up the top of the road and he used to come down with his bass guitar and we would practice at school, after school. So that's how I kind of learned. And also, you know, I harassed my mum and did paper round and, you know, all kind of stuff. I managed to get a drum kit eventually, stuck it in the garage and we used to just, just play. But then what happened was, I think maybe I was about 19 or 20. I, I started going to this drum teacher called John Taylor in Piccadilly Circus. So I used to travel from Neesden to Piccadilly Circus and he was a jazz drummer. So that is how I had my first lessons. And um, now the only difficulty was, he, whether he knew this or not, he would put the, the music, sheet music up in front of me and I would look at it <laughs> and I would play it and I would mess it up, right? And he would say, no, it goes like this. And he would play it and I would copy it. Oh. <laughs> right? So I kind of learned to read, but I didn't. If you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's one of the things I remember, like when I teach now, because what I tell my students is I was a grade blagger. Yeah, because by that point I got to him, I developed, I believe, a very good ear that I could hear something, I just copy it. Mm. Yeah, so even though the sheet was in front of me, I didn't really understand what was on it, you know, but I would just copy what he's playing, but it, you know, but I'm still practicing the stuff that he taught me because I remember a lot, you know? So that was my, that was what I did. I sort of did uh, jazz, jazz drumming, you know? So it was, yeah, that was good. Um, I did try to get into drum tech probably about 20 years ago when it first started, I did the interview, <laughs> which was really good, actually. He put a list in front of me and he said, play that, play that, play that, play that. So I played all these different styles. And he said, hmm, that's not bad. You can play all those styles, you know? I didn't really think nothing of it, but it seemed to be unusual as far as he was concerned. But then I suddenly realized, I think by then I might be had my first son and I had to work. And it was like, well, if you come here, you can't do that. And I thought, right. So I didn't start. I didn't. I didn't go to uni. I was going to go and go and study at Drum Tech, but um, at the time, I just I just didn't do it. I thought I can't do this. It was like a degree course. I couldn't do that and work at the time. The the, the hours that you had to put in just wasn't happening. So I kind of left that alone. And just just played with various bands. I think I, I had some, I did have one-to-one -one lessons with the manager. Do you know if you might Yeah, John? I yeah. I actually went to do a little audition and it was a bit weird because same thing, yeah. here's the list. And I was like, oh crap, I can't do any, you know, I just I just tried my best. And yeah. But before I did it, he was a bit weird. He's like, <laughs> he put his like, hands on my shoulders and was like, all right, this is serious now, yeah? And it was like, kind of like talking to me like I wasn't taking it seriously. And I'm like, mm. I'm, I'm here to do this. Why would I not be serious? What's wrong with you? Anyway, it comes back in and I make a mess of it or kind of get through it. And he mm. was like, okay, yes, you can, we'll, we'll, we'll accept you, you know, well, but, I, but I didn't go there anyway. Okay. <laughs> I went somewhere else. I think it's a good, it was a good place. Just yeah, I think odd. so. Odd one. Do you know, have you heard of a drummer called Paul Elliott? Paul Elliott? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so I had lessons with him for maybe about a year, I think, which was good. Taught me some very complex beats. A lot of Latin stuff I learnt, some Latin beats I learned with him. So he was not he was nice. He was nice. Cool. Nice guy. You know? And then yeah, I think I, I you know, so other than that, I just really sort of um there was a few other drum teachers I had here and there, and then literally just watching other drummers, really. But are you big on practicing or more on playing with a band or more along to music? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got my, okay, let's say last year, the beginning of lockdown, I think I practiced for every day for a couple of hours for maybe four or five months. And then I started getting busy with work again, and let's say sort of, eased off a little bit. So I tried to practice as much as I can. Um, I had a rehearsal last week with a, a blues band. And um, that rehearsal? was... What's that with a band? I know. What, it what, was is, like, what is it? I said, so, I, you know, I said, guys, mate, come on. We ain't, we ain't played for almost a year now. Let's, you know, let's just take it easy. You know what I'm saying? So I felt the burn a little bit, you know. So since then, I, I have been trying to practice just to get the strength up, you know, because you know, it's, it's a demanding job that we do. You know what I mean? Otherwise we start turning uh, house music into ballads if we're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> and one you know. thing I found is like, the older it get, the harder it is. <laughs> I wouldn't know about that, but um, you carry on. <laughs> I do, I <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, I think I'm hoping with the wisdom that we have with age that we, try and avoid that situation because I have had situations where when I was younger, you know, I, I, I can remember doing a, I got called for a gig and it was quite a high tempo gig, fast music. And I hadn't played for ages. I knew the songs and I can remember turning at least one song into a ballad. <laughs> I had run out of steam. So from that horrific thing, I, that can never happen again. So I am always playing, you know? I've had periods in my life when I haven't played as much. Um, I've, I've taken some interesting routes along the way. As long as it's interesting. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's briefly, let's talk a little bit about teaching and I'm gonna ask you the question that we always ask, which is uh, what do you think is missing from drum education? today? I think performance skills. I'm really interested in that, me personally, because what, what I tell my students is that, you know, you're going to go on stage and you're going to, you've practiced this song, people have paid big money to come and see you. Yeah. What is your entertainment thing? What are you going to do? You know, um, people come, they want to enjoy. So you've got to make sure that the, the, the song is grooving. Because if people are sitting in their chair, Start me wrong. As far as I'm concerned, right? I don't. It could be a funeral, wedding. I don't care, right? <laughs> if, <laughs> if they're sitting in a seat, start me wrong, you know. Um, so, you know, make sure it's grooving and definitely think about the performance. So, because obviously I'm pushing right technique, learn this, learn that, learn timekeeping, learn this feel, learn about this style of music. Yeah. So I'm always making sure that I'm talking about performance as well. It's not just you're here to groove yeah because people like to be entertained you know so we are in the entertainment music business yeah whether you whether you like it or not you know i know for myself when i got a gig coming i dress up i think about what i'm wearing you know i don't yeah. just think about the song you know i try to come with the whole the whole package if i can so i try to work with that because when i when when i'm doing like um you know, either Trinity or Rock School is the main books that I use. You know, I, I try to make sure that when, you know, when you go to this exam, don't just sit there and go, you know, smile, yeah, engage, you know, that kind of stuff. What about you guys? What do, what do you think? I just want to say that is a really refreshing answer because it is. I think it's so true. We have not had anyone say that and I agree because it's the details. I think that's what excites me when I go to a gig 
if I'm get, if I get eye contact from the drummer and they're good and they're like look into it, I'm like, ah, they're amazing. You know, I just think, yes, yeah, it's creating the vibe, isn't it? Um, but I think what I think is missing is probably uh, just the stories, stories from my, from teachers that help me uh, realize that everyone is at this point. It, you know, a struggle is normal. You know, when I've been to drum teachers and they just tell me, oh, I've had this happen to me, I've had this happen to me, but I pushed on. I think that is kind of missing from, I'm thinking about like a lot of online teaching materials. You don't, you don't get that. You don't get personal stories and, and uh, <laughs> the struggle, you know. Yeah, but... I think it's important because, you know, that story that I told you about when I, you know, it was a it was a calypso like a soca song so it's really fast dum 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 and I turned it into a dum good dum 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 good you know <laughs> I tell my students that I tell them that's what happened to me I tell them these stories so that they understand what it is I'm talking about I don't yeah. I don't go in there telling them I'm the greatest drummer in the world and I never make a mistake you know they think I'm the greatest drummer but I tell them sometimes <laughs> I, I I I get it wrong yeah. yeah? So, and I'm telling you this stuff to make sure, well, hopefully it doesn't happen to you. So when I'm talking about you maintain your practice and you're building stamina, you know, I talk them, I, saw, I talk about how me playing drums or us playing drums is like being an athlete. Mm. Yeah. You have to get up and train, you know. Yeah, pace I, yourself, I, I, you know. Yeah, I talk about Usain Bolt a lot, you know, because I've watched documentaries on him and I talk about, he, well, he spoke about how sometimes he didn't feel well, he was tired, but he still got up and practiced. And I said, that's why he's a champion. Because while other people thought, ooh, I'm going to sleep in another hour, he got out of his bed and he practiced and he trained. That's why he's a champion. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a psychological <laughs> battle. It is. To play an instrument sometimes. Yeah. yeah, there's there's even a book ab uh, about it called the inner game of music, which it which is the the, the inner battle of actually getting and playing an instrument, you know, and uh, I think that's what's missing the human connection because especially nowadays with social media, everybody is amazing, everybody's perfect, and everybody plays this great complicated stuff which they don't show how long it took for them to get to that point yeah. and all mm. the mistakes they made along the way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And all like, you know, tweaking the sound, which people don't talk about that stuff too. Or, or playing with no monitors, like, <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> you, you're playing and you have no idea what's happening in front yeah. of you. <laughs> you, know. you just have to hope. Exactly. Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> There's a there's a gig I played a couple of years ago that I, I I realized I was off the beat because all of a sudden the singer started. You know, it was a song that started with only with the bass, and the, there was no monitors for for the drummer obviously, and the bass amp was miles away, so I could kind of hear it, and I thought I think this is it, and I started playing, and this when the singer started I was like oh my god. <laughs> It's got to be done, mate. <laughs> oh God, I yeah, I hate outside shows for that reason. Well, now I've got in ears, but when I didn't, I was doing this outdoor gig, and I the sound just yeah just yeah. went. I was just like this the whole gig, going, oh, I can't hear anything. Help me! <laughs> Scary. Did you want a beach? Is it a beach gig? I wish no. Okay. <laughs> I will do a beach gig happily. It was outside of the farm in a rainy day in the winter. <laughs> there you go, exactly. <laughs> I, I did a I did a gig beach once, and um, it was a period in my life when I was the manager of a school, and I had a I was playing with this band Lost Charlies they were called, and they played sort of Latin funk. And they had a gig in Ibiza, right? And I left work 
on Friday night. Yeah, got to Ibiza late Friday, so hanged out all day Saturday. The gig was on Sunday, and we played on the beach in Ibiza. It's killing it, man. Killing it, right? Killing it. I'm gonna say it one more time. I was killing it. I loved it. Yeah, outdoor. The sea was bashing. You know what I mean? Yeah, great band. Nice band. And then I, we all got on the plane so after the gig and went straight back home. And I literally came straight from the airport straight into the office. Wow. Because that's how we do. We use rock and roll, you know? This is rock and, and roll. But it was good because, you know, I, I, I remember positive and, and negative things. And I can remember I was doing the briefing around the team. So this is a school with young kids and that. And you asked about people's weekends. And I said, oh, yeah. And when it got to me, I said, yeah, I was in IB for yesterday, playing on the beach, doing what? <laughs> you know, so, you know, that's the beauty of music. You know what I mean? Somebody yeah, can just true. zap out and do Definitely. stuff. You are also a filmmaker. It'd be cool to know a little bit about how you got into that and talk about your film, Belonging. Okay. Um... I believe it was 2006 or seven, somewhere around there. I was gonna go and study music at um, possibly Thames Valley University in Ealing. But then I started having thoughts about learning about film. And I was talking to a friend of mine, Kevin Leo, who's a, a phenomenal singer. And we were just talking about it. And I said, man, I really enjoy film, you know, cameras. I love cameras. And he said, hmm, he said, you should do film, you know. And I thought, you know, I think you're right, you know. And I went and, I went and did a master's at Thames Valley University, which was a very hard course to do. Um, so I learned about documentary making and, and music videos, stuff like that. So I did that. And then that was the kind of the start of it, really. Um, so I would, you know, so I basically was just making music videos. I did a documentary, um, about a guy called Russell Henderson, who's, who was one of the pioneers of Notting Hill Carnival, which did really well. Um, and then, yeah, I've just been filming along, filming along, filming, doing all different stuff, music videos, music videos. Then one of my good friends, he said, ah, oh, drum, and then people started calling me drum cam. Yeah. <laughs> Drum cam, drum cam. So that was my nickname amongst my musical friends. Um, and then myself and my wife and my two kids, we are also foster carers as well. And up to now, we've been doing it for about 14 years, being foster parents. And it sometimes is very rewarding. In fact, it's pretty much rewarding all the time, but sometimes it, gets very, it can get very stressful as well. And I think there was a few situations that sort of um, stressed out the whole family in terms of what was happening to some of the kids that we had. You know, we had to put in, we put things in writing, complaining about, you know, certain things that happened, which we believe shouldn't have happened. And, and then I, being a creative, I think I'm going to make a film about fostering and this situation too because what i what i was seeing was what i was witnessing i really felt that people had lost sight that they all the decisions that are made because when you're a parent it's mum and dad they make the decisions when you've got a child in care there's a lot of people involved you've got the foster carers you've got the the birth family as they call them you've got the court you've got social workers you've got teachers so when you have meetings all of these people are there and from what I see, they've all got their own agendas to try and make the best decision for the child. But then sometimes it just, there's like a, some sort of, there's something happening where it just goes off and goes all weird and then something bizarre happens. And that kind of, kind of tipped me over the edge, I suppose. And I was fortunate enough to um, meet a scriptwriter uh, called Danny Oak. And she, I met her, um, where did I meet her? Denmark Street. I did a gig, an out, another outdoor gig, funny enough, for because they were trying to do a protest or it was a last gig because they were going to knock down all those music stores in Denmark Street. So I did a gig there. 
and it was a, it was a big gig and me I like to talk and I just talk to people and there was a film crew there so I started talking to them and I met this lady Danny and she was a writer and I just sort of we just exchanged numbers I said oh, I'm gonna call you one day you know and then six months later I called her I said look I wanna can you help me get a script together you know and that's how it kind of started really so and then I got the script got the actors got a crew got a producer um and got some money it's an expensive business filming I didn't get much money so I had to I was luckily a lot of people gave their time you know for free and I managed to make the film and then just put it out you know and it was it was scary because I think the first thing I did was I actually booked a cinema and I actually booked the cinema before I'd finished editing it because ah. what was happening was nobody asked me to make this film so I had to drive myself to finish this film the film is only 14 minutes long yeah and it took me about two years to complete that film yeah so I was working I was being a family man I was being a husband all kind of stuff was happening whilst I was trying to do this this project on the side and there were times when I thought you know what I can't be asked for this this is just too hard I thought I'd give up and then but people you know poked me in my side so might you got to finish it so then yeah so that was the last thing I actually had to book the cinema Lexi in Kelsey Rise and I hadn't finished editing yet and I I knocked on their door I went in I met with them and I said to them I want to screen this film they said no problem they said, uh, how much you want to charge? I said, I'm going to charge five pounds to get in. Yeah. And they went, hmm. really? I said, yeah. I said, I have no money. Yeah. Now what I admitted from this story was that I'd recently, that school that I was working at, I'd just taken redundancy. So I wasn't even working. Right. So I had no money. So I said to them, I am funding this myself people have to pay to come in yeah and it was that it was that kind of process and I kind of broke a few barriers or not barriers but broke a few um thoughts or molds of how people think things can go because we sold that cinema out wow I... sold it out yeah which surprised everybody I booked another screening sold out as well yeah so it was it was a bit of a funny feeling to say oh my gosh because you know you guys you make stuff you do recordings you're in your cupboard or on, in a basement making stuff and then you got then you got to release this thing into the world so i released it not really knowing how it would be taken you know and yeah so that was that was amazing you know that people wanted to come and you know see what this film was about and then I then put it into film festivals and I can remember when I got my first award from America and it was like, right, what the hell is that? You know, so you get your little emblem and um, you, you do a post and then people comment and like it. And yeah, it's, it's been, it's been, it's been good. Um, I got invited to Montreal, to nice. Canada. I went out there and that was, that was off the hook as well. Um, yeah, you just do stuff. You don't know what, what really, how it's going to be taken. And I think what, what I'm getting now is people are connecting with the film and they are, I, cause what I do, I screen the film, I do a Q and A afterwards and I tell people why I made the film. Yeah. And the purpose of it. And I basically just use, I just sort of say to them, it's really about just trying to, everybody's a professional social workers, teachers, foster carers, doctors, you know, everybody's, you know, a professional or doing what they do, but we get sidetracked for whatever reason. And what I'm hoping the film is doing is just really just to get people to this for a moment and just reset and carry on, you know, because I, I said this to someone last week, if, you know, um, we all work with schools or, you know, you might have to do safeguarding training every year. You might have to do a first aid course every year or every three years, right? 
there has to be stuff to reset your mind about, you know, making sure that you know the decisions that you make. There's a child at the center. And that is what I'm challenging, really. So that, those are the conversations I'm having with people that I have with myself. Because even I sometimes I go off. I can have a bad day one day and make, you know, think about, now, why did you make that decision, Mike? Hmm. You got out of the wrong side of bed today. Sort yourself out. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of mindset that I'm working on with the film. So I'm just pushing that. And I'm, I've actually in the process of doing another one. So that's what I'm... Nice working on next that's the next project i have i have two questions about the film first of all uh have you thought of instead of writing a script of instead of it doing a documentary about foster, foster care and the second question is making the film changed your perspective about foster care yes it definitely changed i lost the second question first it's definitely changed my perspective because what's happened is When we were doing foster caring, we were really um, having children sort of aged between two and 16. And you would see them and go through whatever the difficulty was and you would see it would come out as a behavior. That's how it would come out, whether they wouldn't, even they wouldn't talk or they'd be shouting and screaming or they'd get in trouble at school. There'd be a behavioral thing happening. Because of the film, I'm, I'm meeting lots of adults people who were in care and left care, who are in their thirties and their forties. And they are, obviously they are very articulate about their experience. So they, so I'm now hearing the stories from an adult of what it was like when it was in care. Whereas most of the children I have, they don't even understand what's going on. You know, they've just, they've been ripped out of their home. They put in a foster care family, family. They don't, who the hell am I? Did I'm a stranger. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's just disoriented. Oh, disoriented. Imagine if I told you, right, tomorrow you're going to live with somebody else. You don't know them. You can't take no clothes. Whatever's on your back, that's what you're game with. Yeah. So that's, so they've got to deal with all of that as a eight year old, 10 year old. That's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so as an adult, they're able to articulate how they felt. So I'm now I'm hearing, I thought, whoa, you know, and then some, some of them might have been moved. 14 times, 20 times, different families. Um, so that's, that's definitely changed my perspective to keep pushing, really. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of conversations with, with people who have been in care, who were adults. And a couple of years ago, I got invited to a, a care leavers conference in Liverpool. You know, when you go to conferences, sometimes you, you've got the big group and then they break up into smaller groups. And I can remember being in a room where I was in a smaller group and there were uh, care leavers who were like 18 and there were some care leavers who were like 60. And you would think, listening to their stories, that they existed in each other's time. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit scary to think, rah, okay, so we're saying that things are better, but then this 18 year old story is the same as the 60 year old, yeah? So there's a lot of work to be done. That's what I was hearing in this room. Um, so that's the kind of things that, that um, pushes me to, to, to keep going. And, and I've had people that who don't know me, they've asked me, was I in care? And I said, no, I've, I've not, I'm not in care. I've just, I've just had my own, my family has had their own small little trauma that is making us do what we do, you know, and, and that's, That's kind of where it's at, really. So yeah, I've, I've definitely learned a lot from older care leavers. What was the first question? <laughs> uh, if you, instead of writing a script, you thought of doing a documentary. Okay, I have thought about doing a documentary and I suppose the reason why I, I, I stayed away from documentaries for me personally was that when I talk about the young people, I, I try my best to protect their confidentiality And I'm not sure that I'm able to do a documentary um, in that way. Because I, I suppose I'd have to, I, I, I could interview older people, I suppose, um, as opposed to young people. So it could be that, yeah, maybe in the future I would interview maybe older people. Um, there's a possibility, and then they can talk about what it, was, what it was like. So, but yeah, it's an interesting question. What's next, Ben? What's your... Uh... 
What are you doing now, film wise? Film wise, um, I've done a few like interviews and filming on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. So there's there's a few clients that I have where um, I'll come on Zoom like this, and I say, right, okay, sit like this, sit like that, say this, say that, and film it, and then edit it for them, and they put it on their website. So I was doing some of that today. Um, I'm just doing stuff that I enjoy, mm. you know, and because I know there were times where I was getting a bit confused because one day I'll be filming, the next day I'll be drumming, the next day I'll be teaching, the next day I'll be foster carer, sometimes all of these things at the same time. Um, and I've, I've now come out the other end of that and I'm totally settled and happy that I do these things to the point where I've actually created a website where all of this stuff is on it. Um, and then people, you know, some people say, oh, you know, um, jack of all trades and, did, you know, they, they talk that language. I said, well, you know, that's good for you. I just do what I enjoy, you know? And like today, um, I was, I got up early. I was teaching at 8.30 till wow. about 12. And, and then I did um, a little video thing like this on Microsoft Teams. I then did a, a vocal recording and I, I can tell you that I don't sing but it, <laughs> it was it was a project that a friend of mine asked me to do which lots of people were just recording their voice and i really enjoyed it you know to the point i think hmm, i might have to bring that back you know <laughs> the singing thing um but yeah i'm i'm literally just trying to enjoy i've i've got this space and i'm i'm still getting used to this space tell us about your space there because um it's a new it's new for you your studio isn't it it's very 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 new it's um yeah i think i have been talking about building this space for at least six or seven years um i've come close um maybe about three years ago i got a lot of hardcore that's for like just for concrete base and it was in the garden for a year and my wife said enough already <laughs> <laughs> I had to get rid of the hardcore. I got a company and they got rid of the hardcore. And then during the lockdown, I, um, the beginning of the lockdown, so like March, April, people were, everybody was doing online home recording. Yeah, so I thought, ooh. So I set up the drum kit in the house. My DW, my big DW drum kit, I set it up. I went and bought some microphones off, off Amazon and the microphones were there. And um, I thought, yeah, I can do some of this. So I, I started doing a couple of recordings. And a friend of mine, I recorded three tracks. Wicked. I believe they're wicked. They're on um, Spotify. Yeah. And um, that was the uh, Kevin Leo and the Dog Warriors. Yeah. I recorded three tracks. And then uh, letters started to come through the door to say, can you stop that racket? <laughs> 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 oh yeah. Oh no. I got, I got shut shut down. Shut down. So I kind of now up until that point I was playing every day on my electronic kit. Right? So don't don't get it twisted now. So I was only recording on the acoustic. That was uh, that knocked me. That really did affect me. And I stopped playing. I literally just stopped playing. You know, it was really sad. You know what I mean? How did that work with your family? They're playing, you know, recording. How did you, how did you do that? <laughs> well, um, I had to stop when they wanted to walk through, because um, it was, <laughs> it was sort of like in a corridor space where I'd set up, and because I, I had a little, I've got a little room in the house, right, where um, I had my electronic drum kit set up and my computer to do my editing. And then I had wires running out of the room into another room where I set up the acoustic kick, but it was sort of in a, in a sort of a passage way. Um, yeah, I mean, to be truthful, they they um, they loved it, but then it had an impact on them as well. I have to say, I can't tell the lie. <laughs> tell the lie. But it wasn't it wasn't a soundproof space. No. Yeah. You know? So it, it ricocheted 
I can remember one time I was trying to practice on my acoustic kick at like maybe 10 o'clock, which is ridiculous anyway. And my wife said, I think she might have sent one of my sons down to say, mom can hear you upstairs. <laughs> so I thought, oh, okay. And I was playing really quiet. I was trying to play, I was really quiet, you know? But you know, I need to work on my technique in terms of playing. <laughs> so yeah, so that, that just crashed and burned. So, you know, and then I thought, you know what? And then because I lost half my earnings last year, luckily I was, the only thing that I was doing was teaching drums. That was it, everything else stopped. So half my money went, boom, gone. Um, which is good because some of my friends, they lost everything. Went from money to zero. So I was, I was, you know, fortunate that I was, I still had some money coming in. And then I was obviously trying to do all these, these bounce back loans and self-employed thing and get none of that. That was, so I spent a lot of time online trying to get money and that wasn't happening. Um, so I got no support there. And then in the end, and I went to the bank and I borrowed some money and I started getting prices from builders. The first price came in at 50 grand. Second price came in at 45. Third one came in at 30. I thought, man, I'm in big trouble because I ain't got even a quarter of that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, um, but what I didn't say earlier was that my dad was a builder. So I did actually do construction for about 25 years whilst I was doing music. Um, so we had a company and I actually stopped construction to do music full time, at least a long time ago. I had to revisit th those skills. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I was fortunate. I had, I found a good friend of mine, one who was a bass, wicked bass player. But what he, what he, what he does, what I remember is that when I took redundancy from this school, I, I went and signed on and I thought, okay, what am I going to do? You know? So I remembered that he, he also was a carpenter because that's what I trained in. So I called him up and said, look, can, is there any work? So he was working for this company who built studios. I thought, yes, I can work with you. So I, I did that. And I think I lasted about two days. I said, I can't do this. You know, I can't, I can't go back to being a builder. It's not happening. So I just said, you know what, I said, thank you. And I just stopped. And then I think I went and was doing music in a school part-time and being a session drummer kind of thing. So is that actually that point there, I had to reconnect back with my drumming because you, you know, 7A, 7A sticks? Mm. Okay. So things have got that serious that I couldn't, That that is all I could play with. Really? Yeah. That's how crazy it got. Wow. And what what happened was something happened, which I didn't realize because the, 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 the job that I was in, which I was enjoying, I was there for quite a while doing music, doing music. And then suddenly I started creeping up the managerial ladder. So suddenly I was the head of the school, sitting in a suit and tie. I, I built a studio in the school, got in a drum kit, keyboard, music, all kinds of things. Never saw it again. Once I took on that role, gone. All of that stuff, all the music that's been zap, gone. Yeah. It was horrendous, musically speaking. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, going back to the studio, I got my friend in. He uh, helped me a lot. I borrowed some money and we just started building. So I just got back. I just reconnected with my carpentry skills and he laughed at me for four months <laughs> he said, Mike, we don't do it like that anymore. We don't do it, you know? So I had to relearn everything, you know? And yeah, and, it, and it's, so I had to learn, it's a proper science building a studio, soundproofing, you know? So I was on, I was on doing lots of research to make sure that I could get it as soundproof as possible on a very low budget, you know? And I'm, and I'm just happy I got it done and, um, yeah, I've got my green wall at the back. So I can see. Obviously I am drum cam. So when I do my filming stuff, 
Um, or if I'm drumming like a mess about and, and change the background, you know, so I'm going to be experimenting with that at some point, you know, oh, but cool. yeah. Um, where um, is it? Where's the where studio? Where is it? In my back garden. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I actually finished the pathway to the, to the studio last weekend. I got so cool. seven slabs. One, two, three, four, <laughs> which I step on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. And I think, but also as well, because you asked about family. So now I've got this new thing that I have to work on because my wife said to me, so I'm guessing I won't see you again. Now that you've got your man cave, your studio, <laughs> your shed. You know what I mean? Mm. I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll be back out there. I'm back in the yeah. house. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I, I, I am having to work on my balance. Really positively my balance i have to you know because you know it's a it's a nice place it's a nice spot <laughs> it's hard to get out <laughs> yeah, yeah and to be truthful i've been practicing on electronic kit for years mm. so to be able to set up my real drum kit and play it it's awesome i can't tell a lie I'm still, I'm still getting used to it, you know what I'm saying? I'm still getting mm. used to it. So, you know, because what I say to my students, because most of my students play on an electronic drum kit mm. at home. So when I'm in school with them and they sit on a real kit, it's very easy to see who has who plays on what. Yeah, so I told my students who play electronic kit, I said, look, when you're playing electronic kit, I mean, this is what I did. I turned the volume down as low as I can. Yeah, because if I turn it up really loud, I'm not going to hit the drums. I just tap, mm -hmm. you know, you get yeah. a massive sound. Tone, turn, turn it down low. Cool. Get, you know, work, work for the sound. You know what I mean? Don't yeah. just tap it again, explosion. You know, and the reason why I mentioned the seven A sticks because that's there was a point where that's all I could manage five years ago. Yeah, and to the point where. I think I had to then, I started practicing with these. Wow. These Vic Firth marching sticks. Oh, wow. Yeah. And these are heavy. Yeah. Yeah. I know those, maybe those American drummers, though those marching drummers play with these all the time, but this is what I practice with. Yeah. So that I could then move up to 5A or 5B if I want this. So I can play with those, those sticks. But you know, at the moment, I'm I'm, I'm revisiting these again because there's been a little bit of a lax in the plane because of uh, I'm not going to blame Corona completely, but that did, <laughs> that messed up the plan a little bit. You know what I mean? So because mm. I was playing at least three nights a week before the the virus hit, you know, mm. to to zero. You know what I mean? So this is this is why I had to practice with to get get my shit back together. Pardon my French. Cool. Yeah, now yeah. now besides teaching playing gigs and making films, are you going to take work as a studio builder as well? Funny enough, you know, my, I did talk to the guy about it, you know. <laughs> so I, I, about, I, might, you know? I might need your service very soon, so I'll, I'll, be, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be calling you. Yeah, yeah. well, no, we spoke about it. We definitely spoke about it because I thinking, okay, hmm. because it was a proper science, right? Because even like, I've got, um, on, I'll show you this, right? I've got double doors here, right? I've got mm. one door and a door there, right? And I've got the door and then two sheets of ply, plywood on the door. Now, when we finished the studio, we did a sound check. So I put the drums in and I played. And it was like, it was like I was playing outside. I thought, oh dear, this is not, I've spent all this money, it's not worked. Yeah. And I said to him, we started looking at the doors, I thinking, maybe we need to put something on the doors. So we put two sheets of doors, plywood on the doors, and it cut the sound. Yeah. It's so if you imagine, Yeah. So the walls, obviously, they're compacted all around. They got, we forgot about the doors. Yeah. 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 So it just killed the sound. So the density of the door, so, 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 so when I shut out those doors, you can just about hear a little bit outside. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's if I open amazing. the doors, it's like, vroom, the sound goes vroom, straight through. It's like, yeah, you know, so that's it's what like, I need here, man. 
Yeah, yeah, I, nice. need, I need something. So on I my guess door. you need him faster than I do. Yeah, I need you to come here. <laughs> sort out my door. I know we don't want the yeah, colour yeah. ruined, but yeah. we need something because it just goes. It's yeah. like I mean, what you could try as well. There's a thing called bat wings. Have you heard of that? No. So basically, okay, I'll 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 tell you. So basically, it's 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 sort of like a, it goes. It basically it just seals the door around. Mm. So I've also got that on the door around in the door frame. Oh, okay. In the door frame, and they're called bat wings. And you literally just stick them all around. So you've got to do the top side and the bottom. Okay. So if you can see daylight through there, sound is gonna just go dancing through. It's, yeah. it's as simple as that. You know, um, so at the moment, the only sound I hear from outside is through my vents. I've got an air vent in here, so I can hear someone I can hear raining. I can hear it coming through the pipe. That is it. Yeah. You know? That's awesome. Yeah. I'm really, really happy for you. Well deserved, you know, it's good for yeah. your own little space. We may have touched on this earlier, but you have maybe half an hour with one student. They've never played before. Mm -hmm. What do you teach? Never played before. Mm. I sit them down on a drum kit and just see what they do. That's the first thing I do. Let me see what you're going to do. I might put a track on. Let's see. And that is always my starting point. Um, I had a student that I met three weeks ago. Um, brand new. He actually came here. And done the same thing yeah because I really I, I try to figure out what, what is my starting point I have no idea where to start unless I see what you do mm. yeah because what I know is every every person is every human being is different yeah and because I you know I started teaching in school and I'm teaching a lot of beginners yeah and it is the freakiest thing where you meet some people that they're just all over the place you meet another kid never done it before and you say, right, just do this on the hi-hat one and two, and then put this on the snare drum, two on the four, and put the bass drum on one and three, and they do it first time. You know what I'm saying? It's like, rah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then some people, it takes them weeks to do that. Mm. So for me, I think it's, I, I, I watch to see what they do. And then once I got that bit down, the next thing I try to do is, because I, I want them to try and leave that room and to be able to play a beat of some description. Yeah. I don't really go straight into doing, yes, this is a power diddle and, and, and double stroke roll. And, you know, I said, right, I'll, I'll, I'll go, give me some either eighth notes on the hi hat, two and four on the snare, one and three on the bass drum. So that's, that's my beat. And if they, most times they, they able to play that. And I say to them, that is your beat. I said, that beat will fit anything. Right, and they're generally happy that they can play that beat, and then I'm good. And then after that, I go more technical on them, and you know, after weeks go on. Cool. Hold nice. a beat. Hold a beat. Hold a beat. At the end of the day, I think it's all said and done, right? With all the 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 stuff that we're learning, all the technical things, and crossing over and turning your hat sideways and all kind of thing. <laughs> at the end of the day you've got to play a beat exactly you know yeah. yeah you know it doesn't matter which way you turn it you've got to be able to play a beat if you're going to you know play with other people you yeah. know and in and in time and that is that is the bottom line you know true definitely thank you mike thank you very much thank, thank you for your you. time and your great. stories and everything love it